Okay, so I work as a developmental editor, so I, I get the manuscript. When you work with someone like me, you get really in-depth um, information, and also I usually send a 5 to 20 page single space memo. What I'm doing is I, I walk around with the book in my head all the time, and like I get ideas in the middle of the night and I have to get up and write them down, just like when you're writing. I feel like a puzzle master, I'm, I'm looking for all the puzzle pieces. What I often find out is that the ending doesn't work is one of the big things. I find out that um, this author I'm working with in England right now, she, she had like 50 pages of backstory. And I wrote to her and said, you know, she was just submitting to see if I, I met her in Dublin and, you know, if it was going to work between us. And I said, well, no, honey, you know, this is all backstory. She's like, oh, but people need to know that. And it's like, no, the first act, and, and the first act is usually the first 50 pages, manuscript pages. Backstory is on a need-to-know basis. A lot of that should be coming through with, you know, the tone and the, you know, and the setting and, and dialogue and all sorts of ways you get backstory in the beginning. You don't have to do these, these dumps. I see a lot of overpopulation, um, just too many characters to keep track of. What I see is great concepts. Uh, but I, I also, on, on a word level, I see just lots of repetitions. I, I make a list for everybody of crutch words, the words that they keep repeating, which is something you probably have worked out. So I just do, I do a lot of big picture stuff and little picture stuff. In a funny way, with self-publishing books becoming um, m more common, um, a lot of what we end up doing is a little bit of gatekeeping. I say, we will not take this book unless you get an interior designer and the cover designer have it edited three levels developmental copy and line editing and then i have to like it afterwards and i tell them it's going to be a ton of money and do they really really want to continue doing that and that's if i'm not sure about the book if if i love the book and i'm like this just needs some help then i woo them a little more a lot of writers just focus on writing a book and that's it and Obviously, that's what you have to do. You have to take classes. You have to have a critique group. You have to have beta readers. You need at least three minimum who are not in your family and who, you know, and they could be your critique group, but you want people that read widely, not just your genre or whatever you're writing. And But then, you know, of course, you're very absorbed in, in writing, and that takes up a lot of your time. But you should be thinking a year ahead of time about how what you have to offer besides the book. If you are not on social media, if you don't have a, a blog or something, you know, you don't exist. I agree with what you were saying that it's not something that starts with the day that you publish your book. If for no reason other than the fact that uh, when anyone does anything new, when you get on a bicycle the first time, you're not doing a great job of riding a bike the first time. And when you go on social media the first time, you're not going to do a great job on social media. And you sort of want to get out of that awkward stage um, a long time before you've actually got a book out. And if you're going into self-publishing, you have to have followers. You have to have a group that's going to buy it. Because most self-published books sell 200 copies. That is the average. Probably the best marketing class I ever took was one that was based all around a book called Guerrilla Marketing which is an old, old marketing book, but I think it's actually more relevant than ever because it's all about thinking creatively about how to do your marketing and not doing what everyone else is doing. It was the March after my first two, first book was out. And um, I was all of a sudden started to get all these notifications on my phone about like hits to my website and mentions on Twitter. And I had no idea what this was. I didn't even know I could get all these notifications. Um, but it turned out that a really probably the most famous venture capitalist uh, in the world, Brad Feld, had read my book and he had posted about it on every social media outlet. He had posted a review in every online bookstore um, and he had tweeted about it. And he had like 110,000 Twitter followers. Um, and so, you know, on a typical day at that point in time, I was selling maybe 10 books a day. And by noon, I had sold like 250 books. So, um, I thought, I was like, I sent him a quick email. I was like, wow, thanks so much for reading my book. And that was kind of it. I would have left the relationship and stopped right there. Um, and my friend, Gene, who's I think way more savvy at this stuff than I am, he was like, no, 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 you can't let the relationship die. Like, he's a fan of yours. Mm -hmm. You know, how can you keep that relationship going? And um, I was like, well, how would I do that? And he says, well, you got to do a favor for Brad Feld. So I'm like, do a favor for Brad Feld. So what am I, this guy's like connected to everybody in the world. He's wealthy. Like, what kind of favor am I going to do for him? And after a week, I go back to Gene and I'm like, I am totally clueless. 
And he's like, well, Brad Feld has a blog. Why don't you, he needs content for his blog. Why don't you offer to write an article for him? And that too sort of sounded absurd because I'm like, I, he'd still be doing me the favor. And Gene was like, no, no, you got to offer him a piece of content that's so valuable that it feels like it's a favor to him. Um, and it took me a month of thinking about it. And finally, I was like, oh, what, you know, what, and this was actually really helpful because it helped me understand my audience. I was like, why are people who like my book, why do they like it? What do they have in common? So I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And I realized, oh, it's people who are in technology, who are people who tend to think about the future. So venture capitalists, CTOs, things like that. And they like to think about the future. Well, how do, what if I give him a blog post that's how to predict the future? Um, based upon the techniques that I use in my book. That's terrific, um, by the way. And really, I pitched him that really idea. Smart, really very, smart, yeah. very good. And he loved, he loved the idea. Um, and then I worked really hard on writing that article. Way harder than I wrote writing the book. Because um, I wanted <laughs> I really that article should. to be the best article it could possibly be. Um, and I posted it, and he loved it. And for a long time, if you Googled how to predict the future, mm -hmm. that was the number one Google result. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, cool. And that came out. And then shortly after that, he then posted a review of my second book. Uh, and between those two things, I was then selling about 2,500 books a month, um, every month for a long time to come. A lot of times people are scared off from indie publishing because of all that there is to learn. And there is definitely a lot to learn. <laughs> and their assumption is, well, the alternative path is I could get this traditionally published and then I don't have to learn this stuff. <laughs> well, the reality is two things. One is, the traditional publisher isn't going to do all of the marketing. You're still left doing probably the majority of it. And a lot of their instincts are wrong. Their instincts are suited to what was happening in book publishing 10 years ago or 20 years ago and not what's happening today. And that is true even of things like cover design uh, and book pricing and all of this stuff. So all the things that you have to learn, you can learn them based upon what's current today. Uh, and that's an advantage.